Hello again, everyone. Russ Barkley here with this week's weekly research update. We're going to be focusing on five articles that I think are of interest, at least to me anyway. You'll find all of the research published this week, as usual, over in the thumbnail sketch that goes with this video. So uh, let's get started because we have a lot to cover this morning. Uh, first up is an article that appeared in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry just recently. It's a practitioner review that focuses on the utility of a particular assessment device that is used in clinical practice for diagnosing ADHD. And this device or this test is called the QB test. Now, the QB test uses a continuous performance test, very common in ADHD research to use that, and it assesses sustained attention, and impulsivity. The QB test goes further, however, in combining that with infrared motion detectors to come up with an assessment of activity level or movement during the task itself. And it's believed that by combining the two, one ought to get a much more uh, reliable and accurate diagnostic test for ADHD. Now, in this review, they not only discuss this test in detail, but they conduct a meta-analysis of the research on the accuracy of this test for diagnosis of ADHD. And the conclusion from all of their review uh, is that while the sensitivity and specificity of the device is of moderate sensitivity, uh, it is not up to a level where it would be recommended as a standalone test for clinical diagnosis, which means it simply isn't accurate enough. Uh, to my chagrin, the authors focused on two statistics that are not so relevant to clinical practice, and that is sensitivity and specificity. These are the odds that if you have the diagnosis, you will get a normal or abnormal score on the test. But that's not the way things work in clinical practice. They're actually the opposite. We don't know the clinical diagnosis. We want to know what are the odds, given an abnormal score on the test, that one actually has the disorder. And those statistics are called positive and negative predictive power. Interesting, most studies don't calculate those. And certainly most companies that are publishing these tests and marketing them for diagnosis don't publish them either. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, other than that maybe they're not very good. I know when I looked at those statistics in a number of tests that we were using in our clinic and labs, the positive and negative predictive power were low enough that we would not recommend any of those tests for diagnosis. And I think the same can be said here uh, as well. So overall, the authors conclude that when used on its own, the QB test scores available to clinicians are not sufficiently accurate in discriminating between ADHD and non-ADHD clinical cases. Uh, it may be that by combining the QB test with other clinical evaluations, interviews, rating scales, and so on. Uh, it might add something to the mix. I'm not sure about that because uh, why bother if you can reach a diagnosis using those more traditional means? Why would one want to add the expense of this test to the battery uh, being used for the evaluation? So, um, but I mean, let's give it a break and say maybe it could be used as a combination with other sources of information, but, but that needs to be evaluated separately. We, we simply can't reach that conclusion from this review. So there you have it, a very popular test used in clinical practice being found not to be especially accurate for clinical diagnosis. Next up is a review article um, that was, or not a review, but a research article that was published in the European Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, and this is an assessment of reports of pain in adolescence. And it looks at the relationship between self-reported pain events and different psychiatric diagnoses. The, um, I think the important part of this study was its sample size. It uses more than 1,608 Swedish upper secondary school students between the ages of 15 and 19, and it collected data from them uh, using the Mental and Somatic Health Survey 
uh, on not only their presence of psychiatric problems, but also their self-reports of pain. Uh, the study, I think, is interesting because uh, it can extend the results of earlier longitudinal studies, such as my own, that found that by adulthood, children diagnosed with ADHD in young adulthood were reporting a variety of vague medical problems, pain included, uh, in adulthood. And so these could be psychosomatic or what we call somatic disorders, uh, or they could be legitimate reports of pain. We, we simply don't know. But at this point, we did find that ADHD diagnosed in childhood did increase reports of pain and other medical problems by adulthood. Well, this study found very much the same thing. It found a significant association, as you see here, between pain frequency, pain intensity, and the presence of certain psychiatric diagnoses or any psychiatric diagnosis. They did find that female adolescents reported more frequent and intense pain episodes uh, in groups with or without psychiatric diagnoses. So there's something about the female sex here that is linking up with higher reports of pain. But it then went on and found that the presence of a psychiatric diagnosis uh, had a comparatively lesser impact on pain frequency in females than it did on males, suggesting that there's kind of a sex by diagnosis interaction going on here, meaning that males, if they had a psychiatric diagnosis, were even more likely to report pain frequency and intensity uh, than did females with a psychiatric diagnosis. So what they found is that in these adolescents, ADHD, more than any other disorder, was most likely to be associated with pain frequency. Not with intensity, but just with the frequency with which pain episodes had occur. Predominantly, by the way, these were headaches and low back pain. The authors went on to report that coexisting depression and anxiety further heightened the likelihood of reports of pain, but ADHD alone was enough to elevate those reported uh, pain episodes. So uh, again, I want to emphasize it's primarily headache and back pain, but once again, we're seeing there's something about ADHD that's linking up with reports of pain, in this case, in adolescents. So, all right, let's move on to our third study. This was in the archives of clinical neuropsychology, uh, and it's a relatively large study of the relationship between gestational age, which refers to the length of pregnancy, and the development of autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, or both disorders seen in combination. And this particular study focused on 10,711 children and adolescents that were being followed in the Environmental Influences and Child Health Outcomes Program. And they looked at the length of pregnancy uh, and prematurity, which was defined as extremely preterm, 36 weeks or less, uh, and the relationship between that and ASD, ADHD, or the combination of the two. And they found that there was a significant link between the gestational age, a negative relationship, in other words, the lower the gestational age, the greater the risk for these disorders, both ASD and ADHD and their combination. They found that with each added week of gestational age, that is pregnancy, it reduced the likelihood of these disorders by nearly 6%. So once again, we have one more, in this case, large study added to many, many previous studies that have found a relationship between premature birth and risk of autism spectrum and risk of ADHD. So uh, again, one more study, this very large study finding that association. Next up is a paper that appeared in BMC Psychiatry. This is on the relationship between family screen time with various technological devices and risk of ADHD in the children. And interesting about this study is not only does it use a large sample, this happens to be a sample in Taiwan, and they recruited 24,200 
mother-child pairs. And then they assessed the amount of time that fathers, mothers, and the children were spending on screens. Uh, so I think a, a very important assessment here. What did they find? Uh, they found that uh, out of the more than 16,651 singletons, in other words, they're putting twins aside at the moment, uh, they found that 382 of them had a diagnosis of ADHD before the age of eight years. So uh, a prevalence rate of about 2.3% among the children in this study. They found no significant relationship between either the children's screen time or the father's screen time and the risk for ADHD in the study. However, they found that when compared to children whose mothers spent less time on screens, those whose mothers spent three hours or more a day looking at screens on their technological devices, their children were more likely to have been diagnosed with ADHD. Now, we're not talking about some causal relationship between moms looking at screens and kids having ADHD. What this probably suggests is a genetic link, and that is that mothers with ADHD are more likely to spend more time on screens, and they're more likely to have children who are diagnosed with ADHD. The screen time is simply a marker for maternal adult ADHD, in my opinion. They didn't look at that specifically because they didn't assess ADHD in the parents, but that's one possible explanation for this relationship. So uh, a very interesting study, I thought, that you might want to uh, know about. Uh, next up is going to be a study on the genetic contribution between ADHD and various substance use disorders. Uh, I like this particular study published in European Neuropsychopharmacology because, once again, it uses a substantial clinical population. 51,568 individuals were evaluated uh, in this particular study, so uh, a very large sample size. And what they found is a strong genetic relationship between the genetics of ADHD, they did, had a genome-wide association a set of data here in these individuals, so they looked at the degree to which ADHD genes were also linked with problematic use of substances. And they found that there was a genetic correlation between ADHD genetic risk and cannabis use disorder, problematic alcohol use disorder, uh, the use of uh, opioids, uh, and problematic tobacco use disorder. So all four disorders were found to have an underlying genetic relationship with ADHD, meaning that genes for one are also creating risk for genes for the other. And they found that for uh, certain kinds of disorders, such as problematic alcohol and tobacco use, it was a bi-directional relationship. Genes that were posing risks for those substance use disorders also were genes that were increasing risk for ADHD in the population. So this helps us to understand what we've seen in other studies about comorbidity in ADHD. A lot of comorbidity is driven by the fact that genes for one disorder also play a role in contributing to risk for other disorders. They're not necessarily specific to ADHD only. Um, and that helps us to understand why more than 80% of people with ADHD have at least one other disorder. And more than 50% of those referred to clinics are likely to have two or more disorders. So uh, again, uh, a variety of studies for you today to contemplate. Uh, this one in particular showing genetic risk between ADHD and substance use disorders. So, so I hope you enjoyed this week's research review. I found these to be uh, very interesting and informative papers. Have a look at the thumbnail sketch for the others that I found this week. Uh, and again, if you like the content of this channel, please recommend us to others who might be interested in ADHD. Uh, and if you're not a subscriber yet, please subscribe. We have some really great subscribers to this channel who are contributing a variety of comments to each week's commentaries and research reviews. Uh, and by the way, I do see 
all of those replies. I can't necessarily take the time to reply to all of them. Some of them don't necessarily need replies at all. And I certainly want to thank the many, many people who have in their replies um, thanked me for creating this channel and for disseminating science-based information on ADHD. To all of you who express that kind of gratitude, uh, I am truly grateful for your support of me and of this channel. Uh, and I am honored that you would take the time to write me about that. So thank you all very much for those expressions of support and gratitude. Okay, well, that's it for the week. Uh, maybe the moose will show up next week. We'll see. We're coming up on Oktoberfest here, not to mention Halloween, so watch out for those, uh, and you might well see me dressing up yet again. So, all right, everybody, have a great day, and we'll see you next week on this channel. Be well.